couple minutes past the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks again for joining. Um, this is Katie Goldsmith. I am the program manager at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, or MARCO, and I am also co-coordinator co -coordinator for MECAN. Uh, MECAN's other co-coordinator, Grace Saba, will be presenting today on the work underway by the MECAN Research Priorities Work Group. Uh, but before I dive into that, uh, real quick, we are on the third webinar in our second series today, and uh, heads up that all previous webinars can be found posted on the MECAN website at midacan.org. Uh, coming up on March 6th, we'll have, uh, similar to today, we'll have an update from our monitoring plan work group and another opportunity to get some feedback from you all um, on the efforts of that group thus far. And as always, if you have any other ideas for webinars that you would be interested in seeing, or if you yourself are, uh, have some a topic of interest that you think might be useful to have a webinar for, we're always welcoming new ideas. So please feel free to email us at info at midacan.org. So as I said, Grace Saba will be presenting today on the efforts to date of the MECAN Research Priorities Work Group and their development of Mid-Atlantic Research Priorities. Grace Saba is an assistant professor at Rutgers University in the Center for Ocean Observing Leadership. She also serves as Ocean Acidification Innovation Lead for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observing System, or MARACUS, and of course, co-leads MECAN. Her research interests include understanding zooplankton and fish response to changing ocean conditions, including acidification. And she is currently working on a project that has integrated a deep sea Durafet pH sensor into an autonomous underwater glider to enhance regional acidification monitoring efforts. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the webinar today for any questions or comments or, you know, general feedback. We'd love to hear from you all on the work that we've been developing over the past several months. Um, so please feel free to do so throughout the presentation, and I will collate those comments from the questions and chat box functions um, and, and bring them up at the end during our Q&A slash feedback session. Uh, one final reminder that this webinar, as previous webinars, will be recorded and it will be available on the MECAN website on our resources page with the other webinar series. So without further ado, let me switch it over to Grace. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm Grace Saba, as Katie said. So for this presentation, I'll start with a little bit of history on how the developing research priorities in the Mid-Atlantic was initiated. And then I'll move on to summarize the progress we've made so far with that working group. The purpose of this presentation is to get feedback from our community. So that means you. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Um, and then we want to incorporate your feedback into our developing document. Um, can I advance the slide? <laughs> One second. There we go. Um, so on May 9th of uh, just last year, we convened our first one-day workshop with network members. This included scientific experts, coastal managers, industry stakeholders, and others uh, to discuss the state of the science and monitoring and research needs in our region from the Mid-Atlantic region from the south of Long Island, New York, down to and including Virginia. So this workshop actually built off an earlier four-part webinar series that we hosted from December of 2016 through March of 2017. But during the workshop, we had three focus breakout sessions. One focused on developing a monitoring plan for the Mid-Atlantic, um, another focused on ecological research gaps, and a third that discussed stakeholder needs and concerns. So a major outcome from these workshop breakout sessions was the formation of the research priorities and monitoring plan working groups. And these groups consist of MACAN members with diverse expertise. So both groups include stakeholders 
in order to incorporate their needs and concerns. So today's presentation is focused on the work of the Research Priorities Working Group. And as Katie mentioned before, next month's webinar will be focused on the development of a monitoring plan for the Mid-Atlantic. So I'd like to begin with the reason why we are doing this in the first place. So fishing in the Mid-Atlantic region has played a foundational role for coastal communities in the past, and it still remains culturally important as a source of identity, community, and pride. So the fisheries and broader ocean economies of the Mid-Atlantic are important job creators and revenue drivers for this region. So in 2014, for example, the Mid-Atlantic wages for employment in the ocean living resources industry totaled $265.8 million. The total economy, including six, sex six sectors, which may, to, uh, to varying degrees, be directly or indirectly impacted by the changes from acidification to coastal and ocean ecosystems, totaled $25.26 billion in wages. So, and these six, six sectors include living resources, marine construction, uh, ship and boat construction, marine transportation, offshore marine extraction, and tourism and recreation, of course. So additionally, uh, total revenue for landings for finfish and shellfish in the Mid-Atlantic were on average about $500 million each year between 2011 and 2015. About 75% of that is contributed by shellfish, as you can see in that table. And of that, the Atlantic Coast oyster Aquaculture is estimated to have a value of around $30 million per year, and farmed clam and oyster harvest amount to about, I think, $75 million per year. So additionally, there is concern that these resources could be at risk due to both ocean and coastal acidification. So ocean acidification is driven by the ocean's absorption of increasing atmospheric CO2, um, it's happening here on the U.S. Atlantic coast um, in, our, in our shelf waters at rates comparable to the global average. This is qu equivalent to about a 30% increase in acidity since the Industrial Revolution, and this increase is projected to continue. So this is just an example of some data provided by Wei Jun Tsai and Rick Wenenkoff from a cross-shelf New Jersey transect taken during the 2015 East Coast Ocean Acidification Cruise. So here you can see areas of low pH associated, where's my, there, there we are, um, sorry. Here you can see areas of low pH here in the, t in the upper panel associated with the cold pool, as well as near shore bottom waters. So furthermore, the, mid the coastal mid-Atlantic region, it's dominated by major estuaries, so the Chesapeake Bay, the Delaware Estuary, and coastal bays such as Barnegat Bay, and as such are impacted by coastal acidification. Um, rivers and estuaries are naturally acidic due to sediments, uh, terrigenous materials, high productivity, which leads to respiration, and lower buffering capacity due to low salinity. And these systems are really shallow. They experience rapid temperature changes and high biological activity that strongly influence um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in seawater, or PCO2. Um, as well as pH. So this is from processes such as photosynthesis, benthic respiration, and in tidal marshes, root respiration. So here in this figure, you can see pCO2 measured in the surface waters in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, it's higher, the pCO2 is much higher, um, shown by the yellow and green colors, near the fresher portion of the Chesapeake Bay main stem. And this is, was a consistent pattern measured during cruises in both August of 2013 and April 2015. So because of the combined potential sensitivity to both ocean and coastal acidification in our region and our valuable marine resources, there was a community-driven effort to begin developing the research priorities. So the research priorities working group consists of the people listed here. So as you can see, uh, the members represent a range of expertise and affiliation. This includes academic and federal researchers, nonprofits, natural resource and water quality managers, and stakeholders too. And I just, I just wanna emphasize that this membership is on a volunteer basis. So I wanna take a moment to directly thank you all for your time and efforts to pull this together. 
it is a huge undertaking. Um, and we, we've been working really hard and we could only have accomplished this through our team effort. So thank you again very much. And I just want to give you guys some credit for, for all your hard work. So we began with the mission statement. So the research priorities working group works to identify research gaps in the understanding of regional acidification impacts that will be used as a framework for researchers to focus future efforts. So we are focused on a wide range of scale from single species to major taxonomic groups seen by these images here, um, and then all the way to ecosystems. Then we made the decision um, on a white paper as the most appropriate format we felt would be best suited to our target audience, the research community. Although we do plan to put together a summary document tar targeted to our stakeholders once the white paper is completed, um, so that'll be an undertaking that we do after, after the white paper. So we developed an outline and members of the working group signed up to lead specific sections. And then we have monthly writing assignments and calls. And we've done this since September of last year uh, to discuss progress and, and to keep mo moving forward. So we are targeting our submission for the summer. So again, the idea for today's webinar is to present what this working group has put together so far and provide sufficient time at the end of this presentation for you listeners to provide us some feedback for our working group so that we can improve our document or add to it if we've totally missed something. Hopefully that's not the case. So our outline for the white paper and what I'll be presenting today is that we first want to identify regionally relevant species that may be vulnerable to acidification. Um, we are going to synthesize existing ecological impacts data, so things like major taxonomic groups. Um, and then we're aiming to identify gaps. So we're, these include things like considering experimental design, um, acclimation adaptation capacity of organisms, consider multidisciplinary research needs. These things include ecosystems and multi-stressors. And then connect potential impacts of organisms to ecosystem services and the economy. So first, um, there are several ways to categorize the importance of a species, so including those that are important numerically, so if they're highly abundant or rare or endangered on the other end. Ecologically, so those that serve a key role in its habitat and or the food web. Uh, economically, so that we're all familiar with that, commercially or recreationally exploited organisms. And those that represent cultural and or historic icons. Um, species can be labeled important based on one single or multiple categories. So oysters, for example, have economic, cultural, and historical importance in the Mid-Atlantic. And oyster restoration areas in the region are becoming more prominent as well. Some representative ecologically important groups in the Mid-Atlantic include marine mammals, sea turtles, deep sea corals, ribbed mussels, which are currently being cultivated for use in living shorelines in Delaware. And horseshoe crabs that are a primary food source for migratory shorebirds. So, um, and then economically important species include oysters, as I mentioned before, scallops, Atlantic deep sea red crab, and other species managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council um, and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So because the list of important Mid-Atlantic species includes several taxonomic groups, which have been shown to be sensitive to acidification, there is much overlap between species or major taxa labeled important and vulnerable to acidification. So yeah, cal calcifying organisms, for instance, are a potentially vulnerable group. And these include oysters, hard clams, uh, sea scallops, bay scallops, ocean quahogs, rib mussels, and deep sea corals. So it, it includes a lot of groups. And then some crustaceans, so things like blue crabs, horseshoe crabs, Atlantic deep sea crabs, lobsters, and fin fish, including striped bass, menhaden flounder, and mollusks, including squid, and seagrasses which are really important in our region, should also be considered vulnerable based on recent research findings and their ecological economic importance. So we then begin to look across the taxonomic groups of potentially affected processes. So this figure uh, presented by Christy Croker and colleagues from a review of several acidification studies from a range of organisms summarizes this pretty well. So here you can see the mean effect of acidification on several different processes, including survival, calcification, if applicable to the organism, of course, 
um, growth, photosynthesis, development, abundance, and metabolism. Um, the mean effect size on the y-axis, it's the log transform response ratio, or the ratio of the mean effect in the acidification treatment to the mean effect in a control group. So in, in other words, it's the, a negative mean effect size represents a negative response to acidification. So as you can see, there is high variability of response within each process, shown by large error bars. Um, most of these processes, for the exception of photosynthesis and metabolism, seem to be negatively affected. But from meta-analyses like these and evidence of such high response variability, we are still left wondering if we have enough data to say that these trends are consistent for every organism or taxon group. So that's uh, an area that we're going to be looking into. So I'm now going to kind of go through some of the major taxon groups. Um, we, we explored what we, what we know about them, about, about each major taxon group. We tried to keep these analyses specific to mid-Atlantic taxa, of course, because this is the mid-Atlantic research priorities. Um, phytoplankton, we summarized uh, very greatly in photosynthesis, growth rate, elemental composition, uh, nutritional quality, and calcification uh, response. So they have very variable responses to acidification, and this variability was within species. It was between species and between taxonomic groups. Um, these differences are attributed greatly to variability in the acquisition of carbon used for photosynthesis and their ability to balance energy between changing carbon acquisition and other processes. So shown here from a laboratory study using cultures is one example for specific growth rate rates whereby um, several different phytoplankton, so four, five diatoms and two chlorophytes, um, responded quite differently to changing PCO2 levels. So four species exhibited higher growth rates and elevated PCO2. One had lower growth rates and two were unaffected. So this is what we mean by this high variability of response to acidification. And then um, species specific changes caused from these differences in individual response. Um, when put into an ecosystem context, context sorry, may alter uh, phytoplankton community composition. Uh, for example, um, in one study, coastal acidification and eutrophication um, resulted in phytoplankton communities that favored small dinoflagellates as opposed to large diatoms. Um, and again, this is in, in high nutrient and high PCO2 um, conditions. So this could create su substantial size shifts, which could dramatically alter the food web. So fresh and saltwater vascular plants, so collectively known as submerged aquatic vegetation or SAVs, they're important in bays, barrier islands, and shallow coastal lagoons. Previous work has shown that SAVs are negatively impacted by warm temperatures and poor water quality. Um, but when it comes to acidification, SAVs actually respond positively via boost in productivity. So shown here is just a, some, a few images from some experiments done um, that show that um, CO2 enrichment and an increased eelgrass density and shoot size. So that's the left photo um, compared to ambient conditions on, in the right photo in a, in a laboratory study with eelgrass. So these results suggest that the negative effects of climate warming uh, may be at least part partially offset in these species by increased photosynthetic rates in an acidified coastal environment. So there is a need to better understand how acidification will interact with other environmental stressors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. So crustaceans include several regionally important taxa, and this includes crabs, lobsters, barnacles, and zooplankton, such as copepods and krill. Uh, crustaceans don't calcify per se, but the formation of their exoskeleton is made of a layered cuticle. And that is a pH dependent process, the, the actual building of that cuticle. And, and the carapace, so it's the outer exoskeleton or the shell of the organism, it does contain a calcium carbonate. And most previous work for crustaceans has focused on young life stages, we found. And the general pattern is that they may, may be more sensitive to acidification through impacts to that cuticle formation and also hatching success, development, and molting, which occurs between and throughout their multiple life stages. So if you can see the image, it's the exa this example of the blue crabs through their molting stages. Um, 
they molt through their life stages. Um, but again, these responses to acidification are variable within and between life stages, and some studies have shown no effect at all. So again, we're seeing that variability in response. So we are glad to see that there's been an increasing number of studies conducted on crustaceans, um, and some are actually including synergistic impacts of warming and acidification, uh, and some with carryover effects too. Um, carryover effects such as uh, maternal effects from exposure to a stressor, stressor that um, carry over into their offspring. So that's uh, an exciting field of research. Mollusks are comprised of diverse and iconic classes of marine organisms to the Mid-Atlantic, and this includes our commercially valu valuable bivalves, so oysters, clams, scallops, etc., gastropods such as snails and whelk, and also cephalopods, squid, um, including squid and octopus. So many bivalve species have been shown to be sensitive to ocean acidification through direct effects on calcification um, and then their growth rates and survivorship because of that effect on calcification. So these effects, similar to those in the crustaceans, are most prominent during the larval developmental stage. So shown here is uh, the photo showing a reduced growth in hard clams and base scallops exposed to high PCO2. So indirect effects, though, can occur, and this includes changes to physiology, but they're likely to impact the older life stages. So therefore, bivalve shellfish have been shown to display different impacts to acidification based on different stages of their life. So larval stages will likely have lower survivorship and spawning success due to um, the calcification issue, and uh, the adult stages might be more susceptible to predation and physiological stress. So a glimmer of hope, though, is that there's some evidence that mollusks living in near shore and estuarine areas and therefore exposed regularly to localized sources of corrosive water could be more adapted and tolerant to acidification and other stressors such as low dissolved oxygen. So there's obviously a push for more research in that area. To date, only half a dozen or so fish species in the Middle Atlantic have been studied for their response and sensitivity to ocean and coastal acidification. So those studies are limited to lab studies, and because of that and the logistics of keeping fish in captivity, they focus, again, on the young life stages. So one study found that summer flounder egg fertilization rate was lower, and among those that were successfully fertilized, fewer survive to hatching when they are exposed to elevated levels of CO2. And for the larvae, rates of growth and development were accelerated, but larval survival was unaffected. So in nature, what does that mean? So the consequence of accelerated development would be young juvenile summer flounder arriving in bay waters earlier in the season and at smaller sizes than historically normal. So these altered features in size and timing of early life events could heighten the risk of death um, from predators um, or from prolonged exposure to the cold inshore waters, which are typical in winter in coastal mid-Atlantic fish nurseries. And again, like other taxonomic groups, negative impacts are not the rule. Um, for example, in another study, juvenile weak fish actually appeared to be robust when faced with current day and projected future CO2 conditions in, nur in nursery habitat. So again, differences and wide a lot of variability between taxonomic groups and species um, in, in the fin fish as well. So through the synthesizing existing knowledge process, we were able to identify some key gaps in the research that we felt needed priority attention. So this is kind of, this is kind of a summary of that. Um, obviously, we saw diverse and opposing responses within species, across species and major groups between life stages of the same species. That's a, is a common theme between, between all of the taxonomic groups that we would look through. And we think this is mainly due to varying physiologies from things like phenotypic variability, so different phenotypic expressions between groups. And then uh, we discussed a lot about <clears throat> problems. We, there's issues going from a single species laboratory studies to ecosystems in situ. So, Single species studies don't incorporate predator prey interactions, things like disease, parasites, and viruses. And a lot of times, effects of multi stressors, uh, also diul and seasonal variability. 
um, they don't include that. So it's difficult to conduct experiments long enough to see potential acclimation um, and especially evolutionary adaptation. So there's a lot of limitations to the experiment. So we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. Also, there's very little knowledge of large organism response, and that's mainly because it's very difficult to maintain um, large organisms in a lab facility for a long enough time. So there's a, a need to find alternative methodological approaches in order to understand responses of these bigger animals. So calcification tends to be negatively impacted across taxon groups. That's pretty much well known. Um, but indirect effects may be pretty, pretty important and a lot more important than we previously knew. Indirect effects from physiological impacts not related to calcification, changes to metabolism or development or reproductive success and behavior, for instance. And all of these can affect individual population success um, and indirect effects through food webs, so things like changes to prey or predator. So again, there is a, a big need for um, increasing the number of studies in our region. Uh, we, we, there's a need for more realistic experimental design. And then there's a need for improved sampling techniques and methodological approaches in order to answer some of our questions. So right now, it's very difficult to make predictions on how the Mid-Atlantic will respond to acidification on community and ecosystem scales. So, um, excuse me, I need one second, drink of water. All right, so experimental approaches, specifically their limitations, have come up a lot during our discussions. And this is because our ultimate goal is to understand how complex ecosystems will respond to acidification. However, the majority of studies conducted to date in the Mid-Atlantic have been on single species in the laboratory, so similar to uh, the aquarium studies listed in this table. And additionally, in most of these studies, organisms are exposed to constant conditions and not variable conditions one would see naturally. So the aquarium studies are, they're relatively inexpensive uh, to, to conduct um, compared to the others that you see in this table. Um, and they're great for control of variables and also replication, but, but they're limited in realistic conditions and they're unable to inform on population and community levels. And also they're it's nearly impossible to figure out indirect effects through things like predator-prey interactions. So in short, for the experimental design, future experiments should be designed to mimic real-world real world variability and gradients in order to be applied to the larger system. Um, they need to increase transferability of results to other systems or organisms. For example, experiments designed to understand mechanisms underpinning biological responses. So that's more of a physiologically, physiologically based um, approach. Um, and also um, the experimental designs need to evaluate community and ecosystem response. So that's just a summary of what we put together for what we need for experimental design in the Mid-Atlantic. All right, so an important aspect of acidification research that is very much lacking in the Mid-Atlantic and that has been expressed by stakeholders in our region um, as an area of keen interest is the potential for organisms and populations to acclimate or adapt. So acclimation is actually when an organism can adjust to changing conditions without an adjustment in their genetics, whereas adaptation is a genetic change in a population over many generations to adjust the organism to its new and changing environment. So there are several pathways organisms can use to do one or the other. The first is phenotypic plasticity, whereby an organism can express different phenotypes when exposed to different environments. It is thought that it is this, this plasticity that causes so much variability in responses within and between species, and why some respond positively, some negatively, and then some are not affected either way. Uh, so in trying to understand this plasticity, the question 
then becomes what are the physiological mechanisms underlying those organisms who can actually tolerate acidification um, and or other stressors. So maternal effects are a form of transgenerational plasticity. So I talked a little bit about that before. Um, they can be a source of resilience to the offspring. So it's they're transmitting acclimatization, sorry, um, to environmental change across generations. So uh, for example, offspring of adult oysters that had been um, acclimatized to high PCO2 conditions had better performance under high PCO2 than the offspring of non-acclimatized adults. So they were actually larger and developed faster compared with larval spawned from adults exposed to ambient PCO2. So again, are there carryover effects in mid-Atlantic species? We don't really know, but um, that would be an interesting um, test to do on a lot of our species here. And then uh, another big one for our region, is the big question is, does diel episodic and seasonal variability provide a sort of protection for organisms under, under acidification or other stressor conditions. So here are some examples of pH variability seen in our region. It's highly variable, as you can see, um, although it's on different scales, the two figures. You can see diel variability in pH seen from a sensor placed at the Rutgers Aquaculture Innovation Center near Cape May. This is on the, in the left panel. Um, and actually, this data also depicts an upwelling event shown by a drop in pH during a five to, day, five to 10 day period here um, near July 5th. Um, so it, you can see there's just a lot of variability um, day to day um, or within one day and then episodic events as well. And on the right, um, this is a figure showing average seasonal patterns of pH, which is in the red and absolute dissolved oxygen concentration in the blue. Um, of the JC near sites over a year. So you can see there's seasonal variability as well. So our region has strong fluctu fluctuations in pH um, and these described here may represent an um, alternation of phases of stress and phases of release from stress. So basically the instability of the immediate environment might be beneficial, so allowing a recovery period or detrimental, so high metabolic costs of repeated recovery to physiological performance. But it's largely unknown how this affects species in our region due to lack of targeted experiments and field investigations that include simultaneous acidification and biological monitoring. So you can see where it come, the importance comes in for us to actually do some of these experiments. And then, uh, you know, do organisms, the question then becomes, do organisms adapted to highly variable conditions have a better chance of success in future oceans? And, you know, compared to organisms in relatively stable environments, so this would include estuarine and coastal organisms, as well as migratory species. So, again, a glimmer of hope that some of our organisms, because they're exposed to these highly variable environments, might be okay. Um, to some extent in our region. And then um, we multi-stressors has been a very highly discussed issue, um, both at the MACAN workshop and through our working group discussions. Um, obviously, acidification trends are not happening alone. Acidification is happening with increases in global temperatures, things like eutrophication, hypoxia events, changes in the water column structure, and overfishing um, and more, um, but it's not always in the same, at the same time, and it's not always in the same place. So it's, it's a very complicated um, situation in order to um, evaluate uh, multi-stressors, but it's something that we need to put effort into. So nutrient loading, this is, I'm gonna just give a few examples of this. So nutrient loading leading to eutrophication has long been recognized to cause hypoxic events in the mid-Atlantic coastal regions. So enhanced nutrient input from things like wastewater treatment, changing land use and application of fertilizers, it, it further enhances biological activity, which leads to high respiration, and then that results in high PCO2 and decreased pH, and also reduced dissolved oxygen. So all of these things are happening together. 
Um, the figure on the right was from a study conducted by Wallace and colleagues. They found a close association of pH and dissolved oxygen, whereby low pH and dissolved oxygen and low dissolved oxygen typically co-occurred. And this is a study from uh, Long Island Sound, Narragansett Bay, and Jamaica Bay. Um, these two stressors can act synergistically to impact organisms. So there's an example on the left-hand side showing reduced growth rates in these young bivalves with um, under low pH and low dissolved oxygen conditions. So despite the long recognition of eutrophication as an issue of concern in this region, our understanding of the relative contribution of eutrophication to and aquatic CO2 levels, so acidification, it's still not well quantified. So there's more work to be done there as well. And then globally, ocean acidification is occurring with other changes, including warming, um, which can cause changes in water column stratification. And a more stratified water column, for instance, can, can affect the availability of nutrients and light. Um, so there's um, a lot of different things going on in the water column that can interact. Um, so uh, re regional impacts such as eutrophication, fishery pressures, tourism, and storms are also important to consider, um, you know, in order to understand how ecosystems will respond to future physical and chemical oceanic changes. Um, but as, with respect to temperature, we are already actually seeing temperature-driven changes in habitat for many fisheries. So I have just included one example. This is for red hake uh, distributions. Um, they've been shifting northward on the U.S. northeast shelf. So the question then becomes, how will these populations tolerate the more acidic water in their more northern region now? Um, so there's a need to better understand how these different stressors are interacting. Do they together compound a response, um, a negative or a positive response, or can they actually counteract each other? And um, so there's actually, you know, a lot more to be done there as well. And then considering ecosystems. Um, so ecological balances may shift under acidification and climate change, so with, and with other stressors. So changes in things like species interactions, predator-prey dynamics, uh, behavior of organisms, competition for space and resources, host and parasite interactions and diseases, um, trophic dynamics and food webs might change as well, and also biodiversity. So these are pretty big things that um, a, lot, a lot have not been incorporated into acidification research as of yet, um, but they're really big themes and they're important to understand so we can evaluate how the entire ecosystem will fare under acidification. So I'll just give uh, some examples of, of a few of these. Um, so things like changes in predator prey dynamics with acidification, um, these could be due to direct effects on a predator. Um, so things like maybe behavioral effects um, and or prey behavior. Um, or actually indirect effects on a predator from acidification-induced changes to their prey item. So the, an example of that um, is shown here, uh, where actual tissue production in a barnacle was reduced under high or elevated PCO2, and then consequently their ability to support energy acquisition for the dog whelk was diminished. So that's an example of an indirect effect, um, but changes to a predator-prey interaction. So these inter interactions are pretty difficult to study. Um, however, they are extremely important in enhancing our understanding of ecosystem response, obviously. And recent studies show that ocean acidification can actually impair sensory functions, and that can alter the behavior of most major taxa, including teleos fishes, elasmobranchs, uh, crustaceans, and mollusks. And impacts include the loss of ability to discriminate between important chemical cues. So this is an example of a smooth dogfish exposed to elevated CO2. Um, when it was exposed to the elevated CO2, it reduced the amount of time spent on the food, food odor side, suggesting they had difficulty detecting it. So they stayed away from where their food source was, essentially. Um, other behavioral effects, individuals can become 
more active or liable to exhibit bolder, riskier behavior, which can leave them susceptible to predators. So the extent to how changes in behavior affects the success of an individual organism or species or population, it's, it's unknown and needs further investigation. So I discussed potential changes in phytoplankton and community composition earlier on, but this is important in the context of ecosystems because community shifts from such as, you know, things such as large diatoms to small dinoflagellate can change the prey size structure and the prey quality as well. And that can lead to um, a shift um, in the food web. So it can lead to a more microbial food web, whereby less energy gets transferred up to the, to the higher, higher levels of organisms like fish. So it can cause big changes with respect to the food web, um, but also biogeochemistry. And finally, biodiversity. Um, biodiversity, it, you know, it increases the stability of an ecosystem because uh, many species are serving similar roles and that results in essentially less dependency on one species to fulfill a role in an ecosystem. So uh, one study conducted on marine invertebrate communities showed decreased biodiversity with increased pH. And that's shown here. Um, I have it shown here for arthropods and mollusks. Um, the two different circles are actually two different temperatures. The uh, open circle is, a, uh, I think, an ambient temperature. I think it's at 12 degrees. And the dark circle is at 16 degrees. So again, this is acidification and temperature combined as well. Um, so stressing the importance of multi-stressors. <laughs> um, but so you can see that it can affect um, acidification and other stressors can affect the number of species um, in, in an ecosystem. And under you know, low biodiversity conditions, an ecosystem can be more, more vulnerable to impacts. So we need to assess the vulnerability of ecosystems with changing biodiversity. So in summary, uh, future acidification research in the Mid-Atlantic, it needs to uh, improve the understanding of acidification impacts on physiological responses of organisms with ecological and economic relevance. Um, we need to scale the species-specific responses to community and ecosystem levels. We also need to include interactions with other environmental stressors. We need to determine acclimatization. goodness acclimation and adaptation potential at organism and ecosystem levels. And then we ultimately want to develop models to project whole organism response. So including responses at all life stages and include multi-stressors. So that's a, that's a big ask. Um, but then we would like to couple these models with carbonate chemistry observations um, and with, re, uh, with biogeochemical and socioeconomic models to project larger scale um, impact. So not just the, the biology or the ecosystem um, response, but then um, the social and economic response as well. So we, we need to do these things so that we can get at that larger, that larger scale impact. So thank you very much. Um, I will take questions, I suppose. I, I don't see the questions in my box, but maybe Katie can see if there's any. So thank you again for attending. I really welcome your feedback right now so we can um, improve what we've done so far for this working group. Hey, Grace. This is Katie. Thanks so much. Uh, I just have one question that I've seen come in thus far, um, and it's what is the hope for what happens to the findings in the white paper, um, which I, I read to kind of mean what is the intent of developing these research priorities? Where do we go from here once we finalize them? Yeah, I mean, we want to obviously disseminate them so the, to the research community. Um, the ultimate goal, obviously, is to, to start filling in these gaps so that the research community can use what we've put together as a template to move their research forward. Um, you know, that's our ultimate goal is that we want to see some of these gaps filled to gain, you know, to gain knowledge on how our system will respond to acidification. Thanks, Grace. Um, we have just a comment that says this was a great summary. It was really helpful. Thanks. 
which is great. Happy to hear that. <laughs> um, You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't see any other feedback coming in at the moment. Oh, sorry. Hold on. We've got another one. Um, Grace, we have a question. Could you elaborate a bit more on how dial variations might influence susceptibility? Um, so dial variation. So, you know, in the daytime, phytoplankton are super productive. They're actually um, increasing pH in the water because they're taking up um, PCO2. Um, and at night, they start to respire, and then the organisms respire. So that's, that's a diel cycle. So there's a huge change, a huge swing in pH just in one day. Um, the thought is that um, in lab experiments, a lot of times the organisms are exposed to constant um, levels of CO2. So you'll have like an ambient CO2 concentration and then you'll have a high CO2 concentration that's just very simplified. And there, an organism is respond, it's, it's um, sub, so exposed to that constantly, and there's no dial swings. Um, there's more um, studies coming out now that, that actually incorporate that dial variability into the experimental design. And what they've found is that the organism is much more tolerant to acidification. Um, it really dampens the negative response. Um, because they're able to, they might be stressed out for a little while while the pH is low, but what they can do is kind of shut down their metabolism to just kind of slow things down. Um, and then once the pH kicks back up, you know, so say it's during uh, the daytime hours or something, and pH goes back up, they can recover. Um, so it's a question of, can they tolerate that for, how, how long can they tolerate that? Is it, is it something where if they have to keep spending energy to recuperate every day, will they put more energy then or put less energy then into growth and reproduction? So will it ultimately impact their reproductive success or their growth? So these are questions we don't really know a lot about, but there is some evidence now that shows that diel variability and including that can actually um, dampen the negative response so they can tolerate the stressor a little bit more. Thanks, Grace. Um, we did have a quick question come in about sharing of the slides. And as I mentioned, we'll get the um, full recording of this up onto the Macan website pretty quickly. Um, so stay tuned there and we'll, um, as always, kind of make an announcement to the listserv that it got posted. So. Um, we'll definitely try to get that up as soon as possible. Thanks. And let me take a last look here. I don't see any other questions or comments, so I'm going to take that to say that, Grace, we're on the right track, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> I will and just add that if anybody, if anybody has any feedback that they want to share, um, you can either email me or Katie directly or email that the, our mid I can email, which is on the screen right now. Um, feel free to send us an email with some feedback. We, you know, we'd appreciate any feedback just so that we can improve um, on our progress so far. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks everyone so much for attending and um, we will continue to welcome everyone's feedback and thanks Grace for pulling together the presentation. No problem. Thank you. Bye everyone. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>